of experiments <laughs> Council Research Aid, Carl Cronia, Aroinito, Canadico Instituto, Ye Ohoi Biaf in this. Yeah, they tell us in a dog. That goes Scotina Scotina skeptics, yeah, and a spoilers who fed me up with the horror mask. Good evening, welcome. Um uh, have a happy new year. Um this is our first uh, event of the uh, 2018 portion of our um, uh, our program uh, for 2017 and 18. I'm David Rupp, the director. Um, we have a nice crowd. We have our uh, ambassador. We have the uh, director of the British School. We have uh, various assorted uh, people. We even have, uh, with a tie on as well, uh, coated a tie, uh, <laughs> the former uh, president uh, past president, we should say, past president of our board of directors and other assorted uh, individuals, and it's a, a pleasure to see here. And at the end, we're going to cut our vasilopita, so you have a chance for uh, unbounded good, good luck and uh, prosperity for the person who gets the glory and uh, uh, has the glory with them all year long. Anyway, um, I almost didn't make it. I was so close. I, the Israeli president, uh, I'm not say anything more about him, uh, has blocked up most of Athens uh, for his uh, travel plans. And uh, uh, a large group of us were parked uh, between the American Embassy and the Negron Music East for a long time. Anyway, we made it. Um, and um, we have, uh, I hope that. Uh, um, uh, some, some people, maybe Jerry and uh, certainly uh, uh, Jonathan we will remember, these pizza occasions seem to have something caused me problems getting there. <laughs> <laughs> caused me problems getting there. So it's a, an exciting, exciting time at the, uh, for this, to start the uh, new year off. I want to give you uh, a rundown of our uh, program um, for, the, uh, for this uh, January, February, March. And, um, in two weeks' time, on Valentine's, um, you can bring your Valentine. You get bring, if you bring your Valentine, neither of you have to pay. Okay? We have the pleasure of having Dr. Celine Murphy uh, uh, come and uh, uh, talk on something that uh, is near and dear our hearts. It's entitled, How, When, Who, and What? Um, Revisiting the fragmentation of Minoan peak sanctuary figurines. Uh, we're going to venture into the Minoan world, world, taking something away from the Minoan seminar. This should be a very interesting topic. This is part of her, what she worked in, wrote her dissertation on. Then on Wednesday, the 28th of February, two weeks uh, afterwards, um, we're going to have our Canadian film night. And boy, did it take a great deal. <laughs> of effort um, to be able to get one that we could have legally here. <laughs> we're a Canadian organization. We're connected with the uh, universities who uphold uh, all the laws of the world, including of Canada. But we finally found one. I found one uh, for this. Um, and um, <laughs> the embassy often has uh, brings over Canadian films, of which are very interesting, but they have a certain darkness to them. <laughs> uh, and some of the topics are uh, not general for general family uh, uh, consumption, so it's kind of hard. Uh, comedy doesn't seem to be something that uh, is uh, uh, popular these days, for feature films at least. And I found one from 2000, actually it was 2016, though it was at the 2015 uh, Toronto International Film Festival, and it was um, uh, received honorable mention uh, for the S Canadian feature film of 2016. And this is uh, my internship in Canada. And um, it, is, um, it is a film that is Sta Galica, en français, however, with English subtitles. And um, from what I can see of the trailer, it is uh, very Canadian. It's set in Quebec, it's set in Ottawa, but it has many themes that are very Canadian. And that's one of the reasons we have these Canadian film nights, is to 
expose this country to uh, uh, Canadian content. So anyway, that's on the 28th, and I think it should be a good, it look, it's, it's, it's humorous, and it has some good actors. Then, two weeks after that, on Wednesday, March 14th, we have the pleasure of having our uh, uh, Elizabeth uh, uh, Alfoli Rosenbaum fellow, Christopher Cornthwaite, who's in the back there. There he is. Um, he's going to talk about the uh, aspect of his dissertation work. It's in the shadow of homes. Home, uh, Jews, Syrians, and religion in Delos and Corinth, 2200 BCE to 100 BCE. His research relates to um, uh, both Corinth and Delos, uh, the foreign, so-called foreign religions there. Then on uh, Wednesday, the 28th of March, just before we will close for the uh, uh, Pascha break, um, uh, Bartek Lis, who many of you know, he uh, studies uh, Mycenaean pottery, among other things, is going to talk, um, talk about some of his new work. He's uh, just taking a position at the BSA, uh, and this is related to it. And the title of this is Migrants in the 12th Century BC, a Jain, a Guide to Identification. He's trying to move beyond the, um, the pottery part and uh, venture into uh, what the pottery can tell us about the potters and where they came from. So. Those are our, that's our program. If you're on our mailing list, you'll see it. We also have, we're everywhere on social media, aren't we? Yep. Yes. <laughs> we have an increased uh, uh, Twitter, Twitter footprint. I don't know, what do you call it? Twitter hat. Uh, we're in Twitter uh, even more so. Uh, we've improved our Facebook page. We've even gone to Instagram, though nothing, nothing has been posted yet, but we'll from tonight we'll post something and uh, so that you can follow us um, uh, by whatever social media you want to use to make yourself more productive. All right? That's what social media is about, productivity. productivity. So anyway, <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, we have to thank our uh, uh, interns, uh, Matt and, uh, uh, and Katie. Uh, who came as well, you have a chance to meet them. They are, uh, as well as Chris, they're very uh, social media savvy, and so we're trying to uh, uh, make ourselves uh, especially more visible in Canada, which is a hard, a hard nut to crack from Greece. Anyway, we have that. Also, we're live streaming, so I hope that some of the authors who are, are in the, uh, uh, the book this evening uh, will be able to see this as well. All right. So that's what's coming. Um, also, the what is it, Jonathan? The twenty fourth, Thursday, the twenty fourth of uh, May, will be our open meeting. Um, it'll be at the Danish Institute, and uh, it will uh, will have uh, Scott Gallimore from uh, Wuhan University, who's going to talk about some aspect of his research. He hasn't given us the title, so I can't say Roman Amphorae. Maybe something. <laughs> anyway, he's. Uh, 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 our uh, secretary of the board of directors, and uh, it's a, it would be a pleasure to have Scott uh, give the open meeting and invited address. So that's what we're going to do. You know what you're going to do every two weeks from now on. On uh, Wednesday night, uh, you don't have to worry. You're, you're, uh, just put it in your calendar, have it beep off and be here, and we'll enjoy it. Now, the reason I invited you this evening is that well, now 17, 18, uh, more than 18 months ago, uh, in June 2016, uh, the 10th and the 11th, I believe it was, um, we celebrated our 40th anniversary, uh, 40 years uh, from when the, not when the Institute first started its uh, uh, formation, shall we say, its gestation, but from the period that the Ministry of Culture and uh, now Sport has had many names over those 40 years, uh, recognized us as, as one of the um, uh, institutes, official schools or institute of uh, uh, archaeological research. And um, so that our, we wanted to uh, mark this occasion, and we also wanted to celebrate uh, what would be from 1980 uh, would be uh, the first, from the first uh, project that we had 
in 1980. So let me move forward. So in June, can we turn the lights on or at least some of the lights? Okay. In June, a very warm, can't believe it could be warm, but a, a warm uh, 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 Friday and Saturday at the Italian uh, in, uh, School of Athens. Um, we were there, uh, unfortunately, uh, Ambassador Morrill could not, but we had a video, a video message from him from Ottawa. Um, there was a, a full program, uh, as is the Canadian uh, and archaeological want. We did not uh, do just papers at the colloquium. We also had a reception at the Finnish, in the uh, Abli of the Finnish Institute. And then on Saturday night, the people who gave papers and uh, fellow travelers uh, joined us for a dinner in the shadow of the Acropolis uh, to celebrate this occasion. This occasion was made possible by a very generous and foresightful donation uh, from El Dorado Gold for the colloquium itself, and then for the publication of the material. And what the publication of the material was about is our 20 projects that we have had in the field since uh, 1980 uh, across, uh, across the most areas, most regions of, uh, of, um, of Greece. And we invited people who were associated with these projects to uh, give papers. We invited other members of the Institute who do research here in Greece uh, with the assistance of the Institute to also participate. So this is the, what the conference was about. I think there was about 32, uh, 32 papers. Uh, and from all of those, when, the, when crunch came to the deadline, is the deadline, uh, we received 20 22 papers for, uh, for inclusion. And I, I must uh, say that though we had editorial help, uh, copy editorial help, a great deal of the uh, work that uh, uh, came out of this, uh, into this publication is the result of a very uh, attentive and uh, uh, methodical uh, approach to the, uh, to, the, to the publication by Jonathan uh, Tomlinson. So Jonathan, uh, wherever he's disappeared to. Um, in the back is uh, uh, somebody who uh, saw that everything worked out in the end. And um, uh, just as a side, there was one, one of the participants, one of the contributors, served as an editor on a journal. And we thought we would never, ever have her accept the paper <laughs> as finished. And so we learned a great deal about uh, editing. Uh, from this one individual. And so the volume, uh, we can't guarantee that there are no typos uh, in it, but uh, we work very hard. So what, what I like, we worked hard. And on um, the Wednesday, I think it was the Wednesday or Tuesday before our, the, we, we closed for the uh, Christmas holidays, the printer delivered it, 514 copies. Uh, to the institute, dropped them off on the street. <laughs> Jonathan and I had to quickly <coughs> get them off the street. Luckily, it wasn't raining. And so within the, this period from uh, the beginning of June 2016 to December 2017, the publication came out, and it's uh, uh, available. I shall say, um, I, I was going to, I was in a rush, I didn't come here to have one in my hand, is that it's on sale tonight. It's on sale tonight. The list price is 50, but for you tonight, you can buy it for 25, 25 euros, um, uh, and it is yours, um, and it is well worth it. We decided that it would be very nice to launch this uh, uh, very comprehensive and uh, uh, large tome by inviting two individuals to uh, speak about the. Um, What's the content? In other words, to do a, a, a critique, a review of, of the contents. Uh, obviously, I gave them 30, about 30, 30 minutes each. No way one person in 30 minutes can, uh, can cover 22, uh, uh, 22 uh, contributions. So they're going to have their impressions of the content. Um, I suppose, have you agreed on who goes first? John, are you going first? OK. Um, John Bennett, the director of the uh, British School of Athens, is going to go. For those of you who don't know him, uh, he has his uh, honors BA in Classics and an MA in Classics 
from Cambridge University. He then did his PhD also there at Cambridge, uh, looking at uh, aspects of uh, both in, uh, in administration at Canassos uh, from the point of view of text as well as archaeology, uh, the Mono Palace period. Um, he went on in his career to, uh, from the mid, uh, uh, mid 80s to the late 90s, uh, to uh, teach at the, uh, uh, in the Department of Classics at the University of Wisconsin at Madison, where uh, he became a professor of classics. He then uh, returned to England uh, uh, at the end of the 90s uh, to take up a post at the uh, University of Oxford. In, 19, in 2004, uh, he was appointed as a professor of Aegean archaeology at the University of Sheffield. He is a person who is widely published. Um, uh, his, his focus, as he says in his research, is the um, uh, looking at the boundaries between uh, archaeological fieldwork and uh, the interpretation and study of, uh, of texts, especially uh, in the later Bronze Age. Linear B is his, his specialty. Um, but he's also branched out into landscape archaeology. He's been associated with the Pilos Archaeological Project on uh, Kea and on Kith, uh, Kithra. Um, and uh, going as uh, far deep into, uh, at least in the um, southwest uh, Peloponnesus, into the Ottoman, uh, Venetian, and British rule of that period. So he's a, a very wide-ranging uh, 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 researcher. And uh, also he's a... Uh, uh, in this uh, small world of, uh, of archaeological schools and institute, he's a very steady hand uh, as, uh, for fellow directors having issues that they wonder, is it me? Is it my institute? Or maybe there's something else going on. So I've enjoyed uh, interacting with, uh, um, uh, with John since uh, he came in 2015. And so we, uh, he will speak first. And then this will be from uh, the perspective of uh, the foreign institutes and, and schools. And then from the point of view of our Greek co colleagues, I invited um, uh, Professor Yorgos uh, Valvonaitis, uh, who's an assistant professor at the University of Athens. He did his, um, his undergraduate work at, uh, in the Department of History and Archaeology at the University of Athens, and then did his MA and PhD in prehistoric archaeology at the University of Sheffield that he finished before uh, John, John showed up. Um, and uh, I, uh, Yorgos has um, uh, done many, many things. I first met him in Cyprus, or uh, working in Cyprus. Uh, he participated in two projects there. And he is um, also now connected with the uh, uh, publication of a uh, early um, middle uh, uh, Minoan uh, Tholos tomb. In, uh, in the Messeran. And I hope maybe to get you back uh, for, uh, to talk about the um, University of Athens uh, excavation at uh, uh, Plassey, in, uh, Plassey in, um, near Marathon, which is an amazing site. Uh, maybe we could uh, maybe even uh, do a field trip, a field trip there in May. Some, uh, it's, it's, it's something you wouldn't believe. Is right next near the beach uh, uh, there in Nea Makri, uh, and it is an amazing site. Um, he has published uh, uh, articles in the American Journal of Archaeology, has a, a monograph on the Minoan funerary landscapes related to his PhD um, uh, dissertation, a very interesting uh, uh, editor of a very interesting volume called Seascape in, in uh, the Gene Prehistory, and also is interested in the uh, Archaeological, the, sort of the theory behind um, archaeological illustrations in the Aegean uh, discourse, which uh, he has given lectures on in other contexts. So, uh, John and Yorgos are going to uh, uh, talk about this volume. Um, one author, two authors are here. Um, is that? Uh, three, four, four authors in here. I told, I told them, you don't have to worry what you say. They won't be here. <laughs> I forgot about Amita and, uh, and Rob. <laughs> so, um, we will, and we don't know who is, who is uh, listening through live streaming. So, we, we have thick skins. Uh, we're, we're ready. And uh, uh, John, would you please uh, come forward and you understand uh, how this works because you can't see what's happening. I know that's what's happening. Now that will sit down.
Oh, you have the bond. Sure. I can't see anything. Just to explain, the screen is blank. <laughs> you can see more than I can. So I just need to be able to. We're going to have to change that connection. I just need to be able to see. Is there any light there? How do I see the PowerPoint? How do I see on the screen to open the PowerPoint? Oh. There. Okay, sorry. Yeah. There you go. Now go to yours. Make a seat for you. Go to um, <coughs> move it, move it over. Yeah. Just move it over there, and then uh, and then uh, there is from the uh, there. <laughs> okay. Well, it's a great pleasure, it's a great honour, and a great responsibility to be here to present this, which uh, David didn't have a copy, but I brought mine along just in case. Um, uh, a substantial, a substantial tone. Uh, as he said. Um, as David also said, I think neither of us, but certainly I, am not going to attempt to summarize everything in the volume. As you can tell, I'm too far too much. It's in my because I've never seen it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, some sort of personal uh, reactions, really, uh, to, uh, to the content. <coughs> So as David said, the, the colloquium was held in mid-June. Um, there were actually 20, there are actually 23 papers uh, in the volume. Let's see, you know how many there are. <laughs> um, of the 31 that were delivered uh, on that on that occasion, um, and that includes uh, a very helpful to me certainly, as I didn't know uh, this history by Jerry Shouse of the of the institute, and also an overview by David of uh, the content and and of the fieldwork. Uh, the, the, activities of the Canadian School down the years. It weighs in at 562 pages, um, uh, and uh, 12 of the 20 Canadian Institute uh, fieldwork projects that have taken place since the foundation of the Institute, or the, I suppose the inauguration, uh, are represented. Um, and 17 of the 23 papers are actually linked specifically to uh, those projects. Two projects, Castro Calithea uh, in Thessaly and uh, Zaraka, uh, in uh, Acadia are not represented uh, among the papers at the colloquium, but um, there is a list of the papers that were given uh, uh, in the volume. The Institute, as you know, was founded uh, just over 41 years ago now, um, 16th of February 1976. Um, there have been 20 field works to projects since 1980 to the present, um, seven of which have been synergies or collaborations. Um, and as David also mentioned, they uh, spread uh, spanned the Aegean from the north uh, to the south, from Argyllos uh, in the north, uh, down to Crete and the islands, and also include underwater uh, archaeology. There's something of a focus on islands, as I will comment on in just a second, uh, and also on the regions of uh, Veotia, Rioja, uh, and Evia, and Eubea as well. Um, I counted 12 Canadian institutes, the institutions that were involved uh, in those fieldwork projects. Um, and Toronto and Wilfrid Laurier come in three times uh, among the projects. McMaster, Trent, uh, and University of British Columbia come in twice, the rest uh, only appear once. <coughs> Slightly as an aside, but something that might help uh, start us off is that uh, in, in uh, engaging with this volume, I encountered the portal to the past, which I found very, very useful to find basic information uh, about uh, all the projects. And I think that's a very valuable uh, web uh, resource for anyone who's trying to research the history of the Institute, but also trying to find the basic information and starting point for any of the projects. And there you can see quite clearly uh, in the, uh, the Google map view there, uh, the span, the ge geographical span uh, of, the, uh, of the volume. 
Now, David outlines uh, in his contribution 12 themes that he sees uh, the Canadian Institute particularly uh, having contributed to. I won't take you through them one by one or read them off the screen. I can hope you can sort of scan through them. Um, but point out that, that, um, uh, that they, they, they reflect a very broad uh, engagement by an institute that, and I'm speaking for an institute that's over 130 years old, but in the past 40 years, um, it, it's a, a very a broad uh, engagement and contribution to, uh, to the field uh, in, here in Greece. Um, I just wanted to focus on two of those themes, one very briefly, and that is the field of island archaeology, because as I mentioned, many of the projects that uh, uh, that appear uh, in the volume and that appear in the uh, curriculum vitae, as it were, of the Institute, uh, relate to island archaeology. And this is where I really am stuck because it's so too small for me to read off the, the paper, so you have to forgive me for turning around and looking at, at the screen. But we go from the north, from Lesbos, Mytilene um, and Erisos, uh, through Evia, I suppose it's an island, very, very close to the mainland, uh, particularly the Caristia in the south, um, Naxos with the Stelida project. Um, the whole island of Andikithara, um, sadly not represented in the volume, um, but, but well represented in publications elsewhere. Um, Spakya in Western Crete, the Camaris Cave in Central uh, Crete. Uh, um, uh, I put naughtily Comos on there, <laughs> since uh, it, was, it was directed by, a, um, I think, a professor at the University of Toronto, uh, even though it wasn't an American school permit. Um, and then left us uh, on the island of Karpathos. So, so one, certainly one theme, one strong theme among the contribution is a uh, contribution to island archaeology spanning uh, most uh, of the Aegean. And I'm going to shamelessly leave aside uh, the two introductory papers uh, that I mentioned earlier um, and um, some of the more thematic, not specifically related uh, to any uh, particular project. And I know that Yorgos will pick up on some of these, so I, I feel less uh, ashamed about uh, not, not commenting on them. Um, and you'll see them uh, there on the screen. I'm not going to read them out uh, to you. But what I want to focus on particularly uh, is on survey and landscape archaeology. As David mentioned, uh, that's one of the fields that I've been involved in throughout my career, pretty much. Um, and so I have a sort of um, personal interest in that in that field and also wanted to introduce some sort of aspects of personalities within the field and to show how the Canadian contribution uh, links into the development of survey archaeology uh, in the Aegean. So we go back to that map again and it almost repeats itself because um, other than uh, the Eastern Boeotia project, uh, the Tanagra uh, project, the Western Argolid Research Project, um, and the Calamia Nos um, uh, underwater uh, survey, most of the surveys have actually taken place uh, on, uh, on islands. Now here we go to slightly sideways to another publication um, related uh, directly to the person sitting on my, slightly to my left in front of me. Um, a very important volume that was published in 1983, which arose out of a, not a similar, but a, another uh, conference which was held uh, here in Athens, uh, edited by Don Keller, sadly the late uh, Don Keller, then of Indiana University um, at Bloomington, and uh, our own uh, David here at, at, at Brock University. It was jointly sponsored by the American School uh, and uh, particularly by Henry Unavar, who just sat down, I think, as director at that point, um, and of course what was then the Canadian Archaeological Institute in Athens. Um, and Hector Williams uh, was the person who was particularly supportive. Uh, held in June, um, five panel discussions, 65 participants from 11 different countries. Um, and abstracts of projects were presented from all of the countries that you see there, including the person whose ambassador, whose uh, who's president has just uh, had to leave, has left and hasn't caught in traffic and chaos. <laughs> Not surprisingly, given, um, you can tell how old it is because it, it still mentioned Yugoslavia uh, in the uh, list of countries, um, uh, but not surprisingly, the majority, uh, because of where it was held, partly, but not only that, Pokemon, um, were, were from Greece. And I think that speaks to something that was happening at that very moment, the very beginning of the 80s, of a real uh, expansion uh, in this particular technique, this particular um, way of extracting information, finding out information on a large scale about regions in the past, 
um, uh, at that particular at that particular time. Now here it gets even more personal uh, because one of the contributors was John Cherry, who you see there in the top left, not as he was in 1983, but as he was a few years ago, now at Brown uh, University. John was my uh, PhD supervisor in Cambridge, to bring that circle, particular circle back. But he wrote a, a, a very, um, very valuable, uh, very penetrating uh, essay uh, to, at the end of this uh, volume, which is, goes by the, the fantastic name Frogs Round the Pond, uh, much used, where he, he reviewed uh, where um, Surface Survey was uh, at that particular time, in 1981, published uh, in 1983. And there have been a number of other volumes which he and others have been involved in, in re-evaluating uh, survey in the past, in particular side-by-side -side survey published in 2004, which he co-edited with Susan Alcock. Now one of the points that John was making at that time was with an earlier version of this diagram, this was published in 2003, that with the advent of intensive uh, surface survey, that's pedestrian survey looking systematically across the landscape with very close spacing uh, of walkers rather than the extensive sherding as it often was called uh, or a less systematic uh, type of uh, survey the number of sites found went up exponentially this is a log to log uh, scale on, on this graph so it's, it becomes ten from here uh, to there is ten times more and to there is another uh, ten times more um, so you actually, and the point is that simply the earlier surveys in Greece, those before uh, the 1970s, were finding about between one site every 100 square kilometres and one site every 10 square kilometres, where the new generation, uh, or as it came to be called, the new wave uh, of surveys, uh, the starred ones here, were finding between one site every square kilometre to 10 sites uh, every square kilometre. So. With this, uh, the application of these techniques, we were simply finding more sites. Not only that, but not here, but on another occasion in a volume on Mediterranean, uh, the theory of Mediterranean archaeology, published in 2003, uh, John also uh, had a graduate student, I think, collect the data in order to look at startups of new survey projects in Greece. Um, and you can see that there was uh, something of, a, of a, an exponential uh, rise beginning at the very beginning of the 80s, really. Here's the CIG founded in 76. Here's the Tanagra project, Svakia and Si, uh, Southern Nubia project uh, there. Uh, Erisos would have been in that year. And then the others, because I, didn't, I couldn't update the, the chart, uh, go uh, well off to the right. So we have the Antipithra project, Eastern Boeotia, Kalamianos, uh, Lefkos, uh, Snap, or the Steli there. Naxos Archaeological Project and WARP. Um, the, the acronyms are, are it's very, it's a, you have to be careful choosing an acronym for a, a survey project. They have to say ARP uh, in them, or RAP or whatever. Um, and not only that, but not surprisingly, that was also reflected in an, an exponential increase in not only the publications of surveys, obviously one would hope with more archaeological activity there would be more publication, not always the case, but usually. Um, but also the the great the, the, the stippled um, parts of the column show uh, uh, articles that were using this newly acquired survey surface survey data to talk about the past. Now things have moved on, um, and the point of this uh, slide is to show how the projects that are mentioned uh, in this volume, and also uh, some of the projects that aren't represented but are Canadian. Uh, projects are implicated in the development uh, of surveys since uh, those days. So this is the, the, the time that um, Archaeological Survey in the Mediterranean was published, 1983. Um, the 70s and 80s were this new wave, as John Cherry referred to it. Um, uh, Svakia and the Southern Nubia uh, project were, uh, were among those, but we've also got this it starts uh, with Milos, Chaos, and the Nemea Valley, Cabbage, the so Cambridge and Bradford. Um, Boeotia Archaeological and Geographical Expedition, Governor Colby Cabbage, Western Messera, Southern Argolid, etc. And then in the 90s, I the, uh, the impression I have is that, that these methodologies were refined as we got better and better at finding more sites. Um, and then in the 2000s, we've had a sort of third wave where people have changed and, and changed methodologies uh, and so on. And, and among those have been the Eastern Corinthia uh, project, the um, Saronic Harbours Archaeological Research Project, um, uh, the Eastern Boeotia project, 
um, particularly the Antikythera anti project and West Nargalid and also Stevila, but I think particularly West Nargalid and, and Antikythera, sadly, as I say, not represented in the volume. Now, one way of thinking about this is to think about almost literally a genealogy um, of people um, uh, who uh, taught people how to do survey, or people who worked on projects, took that methodology and applied it to their own projects as they moved on. And you can sort of, I think, um, this is done this afternoon, so I won't certify that every uh, bit of it is absolutely the truth, but um, starting with John Cherry's uh, MELOS survey done in the context of the Palapa B uh, project led by Colin Renfrew, um, led into the Chaos project, which he carried out with Jack Davis and Lenny Manturani, um, and then uh, to the same personnel um, within, within the larger uh, Nemia Valley project that Jim Wright uh, was the overall uh, director of. Um, and then that led to Pratt, which I myself was involved with Jack and others, um, uh, sorry, the Pylos Regional Archaeological Project, they've been mentioned. Something of an aside there is that I worked on the Chaos Project, and then I worked in the Western Mesera with Van Watchers and Espina Valianu, and took some of the methodologies that I learned uh, from Kea and what we were talking about in relation to Nemia uh, on that particular project. Um, EBAP, um, Brian Burns, worked on the Pylos Regional Archaeological Project, and then found himself directing a, a survey project in Eastern Boeotia. Um, and Cyprian Brewbank worked on the Pilots Regional Archaeological Project and drew on those methodologies for the Kithra Archaeological Project and Kip Begat Asp uh, and the Arche and Kithra uh, Survey Project continued. Biblical. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> so, on the other side, I'm not sure, quite so sure about this, but uh, there's the Southern Argyle uh, Exploration Project, which is sort of really behind uh, um, um, the, the sort of, if you like, the sort of American strand. Of, Sorry, I should say North American strand of this. Um, so uh, from that arose um, the Eastern Corinthia project, um, but Sakya and Sip uh, were offshoot really of that uh, that tradition, and Ikas begat Sharp, uh, which begat ultimately begat Wolf. So you can see, um, I think, how all of these fit in together, and the contribution on the Western Argolid Regional Project is, is very good in reflecting uh, on those methodologies and presenting how uh, things have moved on. Um, not only are we finding more sites, but hopefully we're finding more information, more accurate information uh, about those particular sites. Now, specifically within um, the tradition, the, the, the activities of the, of the Canadian Institute, um, if we look at Boeotia and, and Eubea, the Otia and Evia, um, the, the yet green uh, points, uh, we've got Hostia over here in southwestern uh, Boeotia, Eleon um, to the, uh, Eleon, sorry, to the, to the east here, Tanagra down here, and then we go down to the Christia. And I just put on some other um, uh, sort of major uh, places to try and give you a context that, that what, what, what's happening here is not just a tradition within one particular institution, but how these, the, the information that's brought out by any individual institution, but particularly one that's invested considerably in a particular area, co co um, cumulatively contributes to the overall history of that particular area. And so the um, survey that was done around Elyon prior to the subsequent uh, excavation of, of the Acropolis site obviously uh, brought more information in relation to the Cabbage project. Uh, there's a little bit of survey around Kostia, uh, before it was, there was Tanagra as well, close by. Uh, and of course, um, the uh, Southern Evia uh, project, um, going through a number of different phases uh, of survey, covered uh, this uh, area uh, around here. So, for an area like the Caristia, um, you, you, you have, through um, repeated uh, visitation uh, of the same area, you build up quite a large picture of uh, this area. But this was an area which was very poorly known uh, archaeologically before uh, this project uh, went uh, into the field. And then, of course, the information gathered there leads to further um, uh, new work. So we have the we have NASC, the Norwegian Archaeological Survey of the Caristia, um, and we have excavation at the Triada Cave and at Plakari by the uh, Netherlands. Uh, by Jan-Paul Prelard and so on. Um, so 
the, 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 the sort of, there's a sort of snowballing, if you like, of, of the effect uh, of uh, new information which comes, uh, comes out. So the accumulation of information which is stimulated by um, a long-term investment uh, in that project. Uh, it's good to, to know that the, uh, the Paximadi Peninsula uh, area is in fact uh, is now public for a few years. Similarly, uh, in the, uh, in the Argolid, um, the Western Argolid uh, Regional Project, um, is, um, it, which spreads over this uh, area, is, uh, can be set aside data from the Berbati Limnes survey, uh, the Nemia Valley, the Fliva survey, uh, and so on, contributing further to that very important, uh, some would say the heartland of the Mycenaean um, mainland, uh, but obviously these surveys cover all periods uh, diachronic. But just to give you a sort of illustration of uh, how that, that those kinds of things um, contribute, um, in that same volume, Side by Side Survey, published in 2004, uh, Jim Wright uh, put together small diagrams, which you don't need to see the details of, just need to look at the shape of the curves. They go from early Hellenic to late Hellenic 3C, and they're different regions. So the Argolid, uh, extensive, that's just the things that we found without really systematically looking for them. Um, the Berbati Limnes, uh, the Corinthia, the, um, uh, the Enva, Nemia Valley, etc. And you can see that each region has a slightly different shaped curve. So we can actually begin to talk about the way in which different regions <coughs> responded differently. And the same sort of thing is being done uh, in the Caristia uh, as well as a result of the, uh, the long-term investment. <coughs> to um, sort of, uh, just to mention British school work, um, as I mentioned, uh, to the west uh, of, uh, not surprisingly, the Eastern Boeotia project, um, the uh, cabbage led uh, at, at the time in, the, in its early phases by Anthony Snodgrass and John Bintliffe, um, no longer, as it's no longer involved in it, and John Bintliffe has moved on from Bradford. Uh, the focus was around the, the ancient cities of Thespiae, Aliatos, and Ascra in the Valley of the Muses, marked but with the, um, uh, the yellow uh, arrows there. And one of the things that they, they, this project was trying to do was to look um, in quite some detail at these quite large. Uh, um, cities and so they, they were trying to, they, they initiated really, I think, an effective urban uh, surface survey, which again has continued and work uh, at Flews, for example, by Sue Alcock in the context of the Namia Valley project and some of the uh, Canadian projects which are mentioned uh, in this volume. And one of the things that they were able to do, and this actually comes from a Scientific American article that uh, Snodgrass and Bidcliffe produced, is how um, Javiertos moves around, um, as it were, from different periods. Uh, based on, on the surface survey information. <coughs> Given my interest, I would be remiss uh, in, mention, in not mentioning um, the, uh, the contribution that um, the Caristia uh, and also the uh, Leon, uh, Leon project have made uh, to our understanding of the, probably, of the territory of Late Bronze Age Thebes, because here we have Ere Orni, uh, Elionni, the, uh, the name uh, of that site, almost certainly the site that they're excavating, uh, on a tablet from Thebes. Um, and we have uh, Amarinthos, um, that's not obviously a Canadian project, uh, but Karistos uh, mentioned uh, on two uh, of these ceilings, which we think travel actually probably from those particular places into uh, Thebes and were collected uh, at the point of entry uh, into the citadel there. So, we can think of, of sort of summing up in general the, the CIG's uh, contribution um, to some uh, providing new uh, information about un or minimally explored uh, regions like the Caristia uh, and Anikithera. Um, cumulative data, as I said, about key regions, the Argolid, uh, Boeotia, and here, of course, in the context of Boeotia, we think of John Fossey's uh, long term uh, work there. Uh, and of course, uh, heavier. Um, methodology, contribution particularly of, of warp, but other uh, surveys to uh, combining different traditions of, of survey and refining them and in, uh, improving the data uh, collection. And also contributions to historical uh, text based <coughs> questions uh, such as the Linear place names uh, from the Boeotia project. I just to emphasize this is. A personal view. This is, this is what I, if you like, responded to most um, closely, most, most resonating with me, as they say, uh, in the volume. And I'm, I'm, I'm missing 
uh, contributions on Minoan archaeology, and I know Jorgos will talk about those, the Mara's Cave, the contribution of J. Walter Graham. Uh, I'm going to talk about prehistory, deep prehistory of Stelida, uh, also Chiafatiti and Aisotira from the early and late Bronze Age, respectively. Um, and I'm also not talking about later periods, Mytilini, Argilos, Archaic Crete, Stymphalos, and Lefkos as well. Um, but I think it's also worth pointing out um, that um, what David said at the very beginning, that these papers are not simply <coughs> summaries of all the work that happened in these different places. They're papers in their own right that comment on aspects of that work and, and are, are making a, if you like, a sort of thoughtful contribution to the debate about what those projects were doing, rather than simply um, uh, giving a list of what, um, uh, what, was, what, was, what was found. So, with all best wishes to the CIG for its next uh, 40 years, I thank you for your attention, and we go from the maple to the olive. Mm as well, um, I kept meeting people from the Institute 
more and more people, more and more people, and more and more um, active people uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Greek archaeology from Canada or related to Canadian institutes. And um, I'm happy to, 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 uh, to say that my personal experience confirms exactly what is written uh, in this volume. Uh, and um, I'm also uh, happy, uh, as an outsider, to verify uh, Sh uh, Professor Sars' view of a, a calm and carefully but steadily growing institute. Um, and I sincerely wish that it keeps on the same track uh, for the years to come, 40, 50, and more. Um, because I think that uh, the Canadian Institute constitutes a valuable component of Greek archaeology now. And um, with this comment, I come to the main uh, part, I come to the, uh, to the different papers that uh, I read. Um, now, I was specifically asked by David, as he said as well, to say why is um, uh, the, the, why are the activities of the Canadian Institute uh, <coughs> important uh, to Greek archaeologists? How do I assess so how do I assess the contribution of Canadian archaeology in Greece through this volume? And I must confess this question made me oops why can't I guess. <laughs> 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 well and I well and uh, you only have to read um, uh, either um, David's uh, uh, part of the paper or go through the rest of the volume and it um, confirms what happens in this scene. Well, as the Romans did almost everything and anything, uh, you realize that the Canadian Institute has been involved into almost everything and anything concerning Greek archaeology, which is amazing. Um, so, um, uh, it, uh, the Canadian Institute has been involved in both excavation and survey, underwater archaeology, has covered almost all prehistoric and historical periods, there's the map contributions, including households, fortifications, religion, island archaeology, uh, there's methodological specialized research, including bioarchaeology, geoarchaeology, and the application of computer, uh, and the and computer applications, uh, other specialized interdisciplinary methods and techniques. So all these contributions are both beyond doubt and extremely invaluable, but again, having said all that, what have the Romans really done for us? Oh, sorry, the Canadians really done for us. Um, and uh, so I will proceed with, again, uh, um, inevitably selecting papers out to, to comment on what I think are um, the key points concerning Greek archaeology. Um, one of them is, uh, has to do with the Stolida Naxos archaeological project, Sinergasia, between the Institute and the effort of the Cyclades. Um, and this project has yielded a great number of stone artifacts dated to the Mesolithic and to the upper, middle, and lower Paleolithic periods. Um, it is important to stress that many of the finds are products of stratigraphic excavation. Uh, and not just surface finds. Not that surface finds are not important, but it is, it is even more important to find these things uh, in the in paleosols. Um, of course, it is necessary for the absolute dates to come in and complement uh, complement the typological study of these stone tools, as uh, the authors of the of the paper uh, suggest uh, suggest themselves. Um, if even so, and even uh, until uh, wait until the, these results come in, the, this project is important because the archaeology of early prehistory in Greece is still limited, despite all these decades that have passed. Um, despite all these projects throughout the country, by both Greek and non-Greek teams, uh, the Paleolithic and Mesolithic periods have yet to become fully incorporated in narratives on Aegean history. Um, the, the several papers in, in this volume uh, that we're uh, uh, launching to, uh, tonight uh, do discuss how we still have to um, grasp, uh, have to come uh, in terms of the idea, for example, the Aegean, the Aegean Islands were not colonized in the final Neolithic, as used to be the absolutely established view 
uh, a few years ago, but actually that people had been crossing the sea um, uh, since um, uh, a lot earlier. Uh, my uh, second stop has to do with the known papers. Um, before proceeding with, with Graham's legacy, I would like to um, comment on um, what uh, Leute Tari has done with uh, Kamara's cave, which included uh, the seeding of the old excavation dump. And it's true that uh, you can find treasures in uh, old excavation dumps, uh, exactly because the methodology uh, has changed a lot from early in the 20th century, but uh, Kamara was dug up till today. But, uh, it, um, uh, I have to find treasures in uh, excavation dumps that are uh, a lot newer than the Kamara's cave, and I can fully understand and appreciate uh, the work that was done there. But let's proceed with um, uh, Buell's uh, paper on uh, the legacy of Walter Graham, a prominent figure in the study of the Minoan palaces as well as uh, Minoan architecture in general. Now, in his paper, Buell argues how new data uh, proved Graham wrong as regards the use of the central courts of the palaces for bull games. And by contrast, how he was right in reconstructing a blanket hole on the first floor above the central court, because such a hole would serve the interaction between palatial elites and non elite visitors to the palace at the occasion of public ceremonies. Um, apart from the argument itself, I think what Buell has done is important because it highlights what to me it seems a very important contribution of Graham in the non uh, archaeology. Graham was very keen in imagining what the palaces were like when they were being used. Uh, in his um, seminal book, um, he openly supported Evans's reconstitutions of Knossos. And today this may sound odd, because we have deconstructed Sarah Evans completely, uh, to the point that, um, to my mind, he is now a sitting duck. Uh, if you want to uh, uh, regarding his, uh, the, the negative uh, aspects of his, of his use. And, uh, um, and his biases, and how irreversible the character of the employment of reinforced concrete has been, which does not allow us to go back to Knossos as it were. Uh, at the time, we inevitably, inevitably have to see it through his eyes. Nevertheless, and this is Graham's argument, Evans has allowed us to make better sense of Knossos, uh, even if this sense has to uh, include his misconceptions. Um, essentially, arguments, uh, Graham's argument means that if you, do not, if, you can, if you cannot envisage a building as it were, how can you actually appreciate it and understand what was happening over there? Um, and his argument acquires additional value when it is considered during the period that it was stated, the early 60s. And if you browse through the literature, we realize that, for example, um, uh, Sinclair Hood's work at Knossos betrays a different, head down, meticulous, empirical type of attitude uh, to Knossos. And in a way, it may be perceived as a quiet but clear shift away from Evans's flamboyant style of interpretation. Even more explicit were the French Van Fanter, who openly attacked Evans, Evans's reconstitutions in their publication of the Algorad Maya, where they state that the aim of the archaeologist is not to reconstruct in our architecture, but only to document the remains. So, Graham was not really building upon Evans's legacy. He was, in a way, he was, he was um, opposing uh, the emerging negative attitude of the time. Um, if you like, Graham made a call for an archaeology of a dream. And this is not my characterization. It's Alexander Farnu's much later uh, uh, book title um, on Knossos and the history of its excavation. And yes, Evans's vision may may now seem that it is from problems, 
And as much as many of Graham's own reconstructions of the palaces are out of date, his book and his work in general makes it clear that archaeology does need visions and dreams, and they too have to improve along with our data sets, whereupon interpretive, uh, our interpretive strength hinges. Um, and I think such an argument is essential for Greek archaeology as a whole, which has always leaned towards the empirical and sometimes towards the empiricist uh, field. My next point is uh, not Crete, it's Peloponnese, I mean, yes, Tira. Uh, and the paper by Smith, Darwin Wright, on the recently published Mycenaean Cemetery, has certainly raised the bar of methodology and of field techniques when it comes to excavating prehistoric burials. Soil micromorphology, archaeobotanical, fetalith, and organic residue analysis were combined with the usual artifactual and biochemical studies to reconstruct both the detail of Mycenaean funerary practices, such as episodes of tomb reuse, but also the wider environmental setting of the cemetery. Um, and now I want to comment on uh, the contribution of Canadian, the Canadian Institute of the Archaeology of Evia. Um, John has already mentioned, um, uh, as I said, a lot. I only want to point out that um, this has been a long-term commitment to the archaeology of this area. And this long-term commitment has been um, immensely beneficial to our understanding of the area, not just because we have better data sets, but if we go through the, uh, the, the papers that deal with the archaeology of Christia, we realize that the uh, prehistoric settlement patterns, especially from the final Neolithic to the early Bronze Age, uh, are ready, actually, they already fit into uh, uh, wider models, wider interpretive models that we have about the early Cyclades and about the emergence of the so-called international spirit. And this is an achievement of this long-term uh, involvement not to mention the fact that this <coughs> long-term involvement has managed to uh, become the springboard for, for other projects in the area, not just from the Canadian Institute, but, but from other institutes, and has also incorporated the rescue excavations of the archaeological service there. So what we see here is really the uh, uh, productivity in terms of knowledge, uh, not just data or information, but real knowledge about the past. Now, um, um, I had a similar comment for the uh, for the pottery uh, study of uh, uh, from Contra Agliate or Chiapa City, as it was usually known. Because here again we have you know, a, a site originally excavated by the German Institute and then by the Canadian Institute, and then the pottery being uh, studied by a Greek scholar who did her PhD in Britain uh, at UCL. And she's now moving on, she has moved on to uh, Louvain in Belgium. So what we see here is how um, uh, this um, long-term commitment creates well-connected research. And it allows researchers to move on to different stages uh, of their studies and their careers, of course. Uh, it's, this is important too. Now, I come to the... To, um, a long series of contributions on classical archaeology, including the archaeology of the Roman period. <coughs> I admit I'm not an expert in classical archaeology, so I cannot assess them in detail. Um, then, nevertheless, I would like to share a few thoughts. Uh, uh, again, as, a, as an outsider. Uh, the first comment I have to make is the wide geographical coverage of the projects, uh, which includes sites in Crete, the Peloponnese, Boeotia, Thessaly, Lesbos, and Northern Greece. A second comment concerns the methodological diversity that these projects uh, exhibit. The, pres uh, the papers presented are based upon um, the latest generation of survey methods, with the best example being the Western Arboli project, and John has already talked about this. Uh, we have the excavation work at Stimpalos, Leon, Michelini, and Argilos, ceramic and other artifactual studies, Again, at uh, most of these sites, uh, the graph, uh, there's a paper <coughs> that uh, is focused on uh, an inscription. 
the new, uh, the, a new Pope's new reading of inscription from Athens. And uh, this paper um, uh, affords me to say that um, actually almost all these um, papers um, make use of textual sources. One would expect so uh, when uh, it has to do with classical archaeology. But it should also be mentioned that they're always employed in order to make better sense of the ways in which ancient societies operate, and this is important. For example, Pope traces attitudes of the Athenians towards the, the indigenous people of Sicily. So he's really telling us something about ancient Athens at the time. Galli Mortal reconsidered the notion of the isolated farmstead in uh, the Greek countryside with respect to their finds from outside Argos. Young discusses the Hellenistic motives to the temple of Stymphalos in order to attribute the latter to the cult of Elithia. And um, a very interesting um, characteristic uh, that permeates several of these classical contributions is the distinct employment of archaeological theory. Uh, Fitzsimmons, for example, analyzes the architectural energetics at the archaic site of Azoria in East Crete and calculates the manpower that was necessary in order to construct the house at the site. And he does so in order to argue that an excessive de degree of labor investment points towards a process of social transformation from kin-based communities to corporate societies with uh, institutions. Another illustrative example is Carlos's um, exploration of the concept of ethnic identity in Peravia, in Thessaly. Material culture in this paper is considered as a means for the multiscolar negotiation and renegotiation of a complex set of different and yet inextricably interweaved identities from the archaic down to the Hellenistic period. So, my overall impression of the volume is largely identical to David Ruff's argument that Canadian archaeology has materialized what Ian Morris dubbed as archaeologies of Greece. Namely, a field of theoretical self-consciousness of methodological diversity a strong, with a strong field, uh, field element and a holistic coverage of all prehistoric and historical periods in Greece. This has been undoubtedly achieved in the careful and modest manner that is so typical uh, Canadian. So, one thing that the Canadians have really done for us is to be here for Greek archaeology as a mild but well-constituted presence. And we hope that they will continue to do so. It is also important to note that the Canadian Institute has operated and continues to operate uh, as an open, inclusive, and inviting framework for archaeological research. It has been involved and continues to be involved in many synergies. The preceding volume features projects not only within the strict confines of the Canadian Institute, but of other researchers that have worked in cooperation with the Institute from many different countries. Of course, Britain and the, and the USA uh, uh, feature mostly, but there's other countries as well. There's Serbia, Cyprus, uh, uh, for example. Um, another important feature of Canadian archaeology in Greece is its ability to pull together different elements from its main paradigmatic role models. Thus, the, pro the projects that are uh, showcased in this volume manage to combine a strong empirical but not empiricist element, a classics background, the analytical approach that are predominantly encountered in American archaeology, as well as a significant degree of theoretical reflection that usually, usually characterizes British research. The inclusive and modest Canadian way that permits this combination allows the Canadian Institute to be a portal through which Greek archaeology may ease itself and Greek archaeologists may ease themselves into the epistemology of archaeology in the wider English-speaking world. And this is also a very important contribution of the Canadian Institute in Greece. Um, I have not been too critical of the contributions in this book, <laughs> and I admit this. However, this omission is not um, uh, only uh, due to the high quality of the papers, of all the papers, but it's also due to the overall character of the volume. Um, 
it is a threat shift to a whole institution and to 10 decades of work. So it's, it would be unfair to zoom into the methodological specifics of individual papers. After all, so many of them had fit into this volume and they have to be credited with lack of space, if, not, if anything else. Um, so I would like a couple of points that are more like possible future prospects uh, of archaeological research uh, by or relate to the Canadian Institute and certainly they should be uh, seen as my personal wishes as well. So first of all, I would like, uh, as I've already said a couple of times, the Canadian Institute to continue to grow the same way as it has done. Uh, I wish that this growth entailed the expansion of its activities to Western Greece because this is a part of the country that didn't feature a thing at all. Um, uh, I would, uh, if, for example, say, um, you could envisage the next threat shift to the, uh, of the Institute, I would also like to see, as John already said, uh, something on Comos, even though it is not that the permit is with the American school. Uh, I would also, I, I would be even naughtier than John and say that perhaps we should see something from Alexis as well. Because Carl Lavig, if I remember correctly, is also in front of these days. And I'm sure all this uh, research um, has poured into the students uh, uh, in the past, so ma uh, many generations of students, and has affected the ways in which their academic profiles uh, were shaped. Um, and um, uh, so I would like to see Canadian archaeology beyond the confines of the institute itself. Um, a third wish is about the, um, uh, the reinforcement of theoretical reflection in prehistoric projects, which struck me a bit as odd. Well. I was expecting to see more theory in papers on prehistory. And actually I saw more analysis and data processing, which are certainly the essential pillars of any archaeological <coughs> research. But uh, I would be expecting a bit more uh, uh, on this um, in the future. By contrast, the classical papers were um, more explicit in terms of their theory, right? from architectural energetics to ethnic identities, for example. And uh, it, was, it was interesting to see this, uh, this contrast. Uh, I would expect it the other way around. Um, so, Having said that, um, I, I simply say again that these are personal research wishes for the future, and they certainly do not compromise the undoubtedly concrete contribution of the Canadian Institute in Greece so far. Thank you.